What's up, guys? Kevin from BroGP here, joined by my man Rob and my man Dennis. And there's a couple things we know we, when we talk about how cool a bike is, how badass it sounds, how fast it goes, and how awesome it looks. Whether you're talking about a murdered-out bobber mobbing to the bars, a decked-out screaming eagle flying down the highway, or even if you're on your, you know, Jixer 1100 with your hand-polished frame and your neon green fairings <laughs> with your pink trim, how dope it looks is where it's at. That being said, that continues straight on to race bikes, and GP bikes are no exception. So this is Burrow GP's top five liveries uh, of the GP era. Go for it, guys. What do you got for number five? What's up, guys? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Before we go number five, I got to give an honorable mention. And this one's going to be a little weird, guys. But bear with me. We're talking the 2008 Hayate with Marco mm -hmm. Melandri. Doesn't make the list, but it gets honorable mention. And here's why. You should see it on your screen right now. Every single time we're looking at testing at Valencia, we're looking at testing Zepang, we always talk about, dude, those murdered out test bikes would be dope if they were actually raced. We always talk about it. Well, guess what? There was one team that had the balls, and by balls, I mean total lack of funds, to go ahead and just <laughs> run the Matt Black bike all year. So uh, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, uh, aside from stealing many a portion's house, the, high, the financial crisis of 2008 also stole Kawasaki from our grid. And Dorna, at the time when we were running maybe 12, 13 bikes, 14 bikes at a time, kind of shit their pants. Oh, I already swore. Dennis, Rob is bad at me. <laughs> And uh, okay. basically okay. perform, performed their own uh, bailout of GP and had the, Kawas the former Kawasaki team with the one bike on a one rider team. They told John Hopkins to uh, get to step in, and they put Marco Melandri on that Hayate black only thing. Look at that, look at that frame. Look at that uh, swing arm. Dennis, I know you love that swing arm. So right, I but just plus, wanted... plus, you know, Melandri was fresh off of his like therapy stints at Ducati. So he went straight goth when he went all black, man. Exactly. It's what I'm saying. He was in this nine inch nails phase, son. <laughs> <laughs> that's what therapy that's what therapy did to him, man. That was Marco Melesner. <laughs> So anyway, before we get to our actual list of our top five uh, favorite ones of Roto GP, I just want to throw it out there because every single year we talk about how cool would it be if they just ran the all-black bikes. I mean, the only cool thing they had on there was they got some Japanese kanjis right on there. Look at that shit. That's straight out of the 80s. Word. Straight out of the 80s. Word. Word. It's, it's just anyway. a simple – the simple stripe just does it for me and the black. And, I mean, it's it's so glossy. You were saying matte, though, too, but I got some glossy right here, and I love it. It's, I love it's, it. It's glossed up. Right, exactly. Okay, so to the actual list now, number five, we're talking about the 2011 Rizla Suzuki. You know what I'm talking about. The babiest of baby blue and sponsored by Rizla, longtime sponsor. And one of my favorite things with the Rizla sponsorship is if you want to circumnavigate the Euro rules about not being allowed to advertise cigarette products, what you advertise is little pieces of paper that you do definitely not <laughs> wrap tobacco up in or uh, hippie lettuce or whatever else you want to put it. Personally, I smoke my crack out of them, but uh, most people will take uh, a little bit of tobacco, sprinkle that, roll it up, or they won't because you're not allowed to say that. Um, but that being said, Rizla had a lot of really awesome bikes and they sponsored. Christopher Mullen won a race on it. Uh, John Hopkins was running it, running, you know, uh, some pretty good stuff in 2007. Um, but I think that the, the, the apex of the 800cc uh, era is definitely when they really kind of hit the best looking lines of that bike. It kind of looked the most purpose built. It was very kind of jagged and edgy. And that baby blue and the yellow just really set it off for me. Um, in an era when there was a lot of plain bikes out there and there wasn't uh, too much flare and flash that just, you knew right where the Suzuki's were at all times. It's kind of like a, it's a color no one else had used in a long time. No one else will use it since. It's very, very distinctive. And the key to branding and the key to, um, you know, liveries, if you will, that stick in your brain is going to be something that nothing else reminds you of. So I definitely think uh, that the Rizzle Suzuki's are top, is in our top five coming in at number five. Yeah, that's a really good point about the 800cc era. There were definitely some questionable like body shapes and and livery designs that uh, that Suzuki was always on point about. They they kept that mean bike even though it was neutered to 800ccs and everyone thought that they were going to be slow. 
They kept the right, thing you, mean. You think of like other 800cc bikes, right? Some people say like, oh, you know, Repsol is so classic and it's it's so iconic. But look at the 2007 Honda. It was so small yes. and lacked so much body work that you could barely see any paint job or or or, or livery, livery, whatever the fuck you want to say. Um, yeah, they had to make the mud flap bigger, the mud guard bigger. So right, yeah, exactly. the mud guard stickers. was bigger. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's uh, we why, definitely that want bike's, Rob's bike to have that. That bike's because not on the list, stickers. though. Yeah, right. Not that bike and there's a fucking reason why because it didn't have enough <laughs> body work to actually have uh, a paint scheme of any yeah, appreciable I was, manner. I was tempted to do the Kanako Minolta uh, RC 212V, but no, Ooh, didn't make the list. Kev, take okay, us well, number, number four. four again, uh, maybe a little obscure, but mean and cool and iconic again and different is the 2004 Aprilia Kube. Yes, I said Wait, Kube, what? Rob, and there's nothing you can do about it. Say that again. Are you sure? The the, the Kube. <laughs> so Rob has probably got that up on the picture now. And you've seen some white bikes. And you might even see some white bikes on this list later. But rarely do you see straight up gold on a bike. And, um, you know, Aprilia is one of the rare companies that has a very iconic logo that doesn't necessarily have their name in it. You know, not unlike Yamaha with the pitch, the tuning forks. Uh, you have Aprilia with the Gold Lion. Also a dope Yeah, Yeah, Yeah song, Gold Lion. Um yeah, someone gets a free something if they know that reference. Uh, but that gold lion on that white background, it's just so distinctive and different. And that thing had such a bad reputation for difficult to ride. It was very on or off. It was like really ahead of its time. And for, why are you laughing at? Under, understatement of the decade. <laughs> yes, difficult to ride, right. It was evil, I believe Colin Edwards put it back in 2002 or 2003, excuse me. But um, what you're seeing is, I think, uh, another distinctive bike with an interesting design, a little bit different than most of what you see out there, certainly better than most of the bland Yamahas you see uh, uh, currently in what you saw in the early 2000s. And so now what you're seeing is something, you know, a heck of a lot different that really, really sticks out to me. If you're wondering why I'm fidgeting so much, I pinched a nerve in my back and I'm drinking a lot lot of red wine and significant number of cyclobenzaprines to try to get me through this video uh so dennis has shitty interconnect connection and i have no feeling in my back so no one no one has ever wondered why you're fidgeting so much in fact they're probably just like oh it's it's the normal it's the normal that's That's all it is right so i didn't well i wanted the kube out there i have always thought that was iconic um I think Aprilia definitely missed a big opportunity with the RSV4 painting it that color streetwise, really capitalizing on that. But I've always thought that was an amazing looking bike. I've always thought that the the leathers matched really well with it. The red of the leathers really set it off. And it was a really good example of bike and leather combo really complementing each other and, um, you know, having strong points draw on your eye, bringing it all around. I'm a big fan of that, uh, that bike for sure. All right, number three is Dennis's pick again. He still isn't here. Is uh, mm. the Ducati GP11, the 2011 Ducati. And he really likes it because of the clean blank livery on this one. So obviously, uh, Ducati has had, had troubles over the years with their sponsors and actually being able to put Marlboro and uh, cigarette sponsorships on the side of their bike. So much, in fact, that they had to go with some uh, some behind the scenes. Not behind the scenes. What's what's the subliminal messaging with their Cre- uh, barcode? Creative marketing. <laughs> Yeah, so so the the barcode that you'd seen on previous years was supposed to represent the Marlboro brand, and you may have been fooled into buying cigarettes because of that. I'm not entirely sure, uh, but for 2011, they ditched the barcode. They went with a super clean livery, just straight up red. And and we talked about this prior to recording. If you're gonna go for a solid color and it's not black, what are you gonna pick? You're gonna pick red, right? And, that, and, so, and the solid color comment that you bring up really, I, I think one of the reasons I like this, despite the fact that you'll see most of my picks are a little more busy, is that Ducati is iconically red. You know, like you think of the most iconic Ducati for most people our age or within our generation 10 or 15 years away, and you're talking about a 916 or a 996 mm. or a 998, and you're talking about the 916 in solid red. Nothing else. Like that's the most iconic. Like the 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 fucking coup de gras of Ducati sport bikes is just the clean, perfect, not boxy, but you know, smooth, but with like not a lot of a uh, uh, fluff in the bodywork going on. 
uh, Ducati of the 916, and I think that this this bike really harkens to that look while still being aggressive, a little longer, a little smoother. But for me, it classically brings back Ducati because it's just pure like sexy red. You can't really get much better than that. And and uh, shout out to a little fluff in the bodywork. If you notice, this Ducati GP11 has winglets. Bada boom. Damn, 2011, way back in the day. We also get to see uh, Nicky Hayden on this awesome motorcycle, of course. Um, and uh, great to see him on such a beautiful bike. And uh, he didn't do too bad that year. Uh, and we, having Casey Stoner as a teammate is always a rough go when we're talking about Ducati. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that was Dennis's number three pick. He ain't here to tell you about it. Um, but solid, clean lines, super sleek, amazing motorcycle. And uh, yeah, that's that was a good one. Rob, put your Take thinking away, cap Kevin. on. Get your notebook yeah. out because we're going yeah. to school. Because my pick, <laughs> honestly, my favorite looking bike of all time. This is going to be out of left field. A lot of you people uh, may think this is a surprise, but those who know me know on the inside there's alternate Kev, there's drunk Kev, but deep down at the very base is artist Kev. And my pick is... Without a shadow of a doubt, my personal number one pick and number two on this list is the 2005 Tech 3 Yamaha M1 Fortuna in the Juan Mir inspired livery. So they had Ruben Joust, they had Tony Elias, and what they decided to do at the Spanish rounds, specifically the Catalan round, was run a paint scheme inspired by mid-century surrealist Joan Mir, also Dadaist, uh, a personal, um, one of my favorite artists. If you guys don't know who I'm talking about, it, it, it interests me that uh, if I were to think in 2018, if a team were to put an abstract surrealist communist painter on their bike and celebrate it, it would be taken very poorly. But at the time, I thought it was amazing. <laughs> and also, you know, um, it's way out of left field for most designs. You know, most designs on, on these are, are not in the sense of art, like that you would see two-dimensional canvas painted art they're 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 matching colors with shapes all this but they decided to go with the classically designed surrealist artist uh, of mirror or excuse me go against the classic design and go with that kind of surrealist artist look and to give you guys kind of an idea of what that artist was about and and what he had kind of a famous comment about destroying art and destroying that and uh, that quote was uh, let me see where it is though i had to pull up here uh, oh, fuck, I had it all pulled up, and then Wikipedia fucked me. Wikipedia, fucking Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, I don't even know where it went now. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, basically, he referred to his style as the assassination of painting, uh, quote-unquote, and that he sort of viewed – the, the model of art at the currently, especially cubism and what became accepted art as propping up the bourgeoisie or the bourgeois and the wealthy class. And it, it's all very revolutionary. It's all very interesting. It was painted and, 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 and designed in, in the mid to late thirties when, uh, you know, obviously the specter of war was falling over most of Europe when the uh, Franco regime looked very poorly down on the Catalan area of Spain uh, and repressed them quite a bit. So for me to see a bike, put that on there not just from the surrealistic style but all of the stuff that comes with it really really intrigues me and i also like the fact that for their home races they didn't just paint it like a fucking you know spanish flag they went with a nationalistic patriotic uh, you know patriotic style but they didn't just do it like bland and blah they didn't like stick to stars and stripes on there and say yeah america you know what i mean i mean there's anything wrong with that but <laughs> they went one step further and took a cultural icon from the area and then built the look of the bike around that you know so i mean all i'm saying is next time an american races in gp put a top hat a giant beard on it and call it fucking abraham lincoln <laughs> I did not. I didn't expect you to say that one. The only reason why I laugh is because I was tempted to uh, bring up like a Colin Edwards Laguna Seca livery for this list, um, but I did not do it. No, we yeah, got I something mean, it's better. Yeah, I You know what I mean? Like it's just it, it's more interesting to me to 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 pull upon multiple cultural aspects in that, not just be like, oh, here's a flag, you know, patriotism for the sake of patriotism. It was there was reasons behind why they designed this look that way. 
Yeah, and and everyone has done the flag, the the nationalistic flag look for a motorcycle. So right, you can see Casey Stoner has there. done it on the Ducati. Nikki Haynes has done it. Uh, they did it in two thousand six uh, on the Ducatis in Mugello. I mean, it's not wrong, but it's it, it's not different. It's not class. It's not. Uh, it doesn't stand out and, and make it its own statement. It's just another flag bike which we've all seen a million of you know what i mean exactly i mean even the sky vr 46 uh moto 2 and moto 3 team had to drop the uh, italian flag colors in a delivery for the italian rounds right Right. so it's it's now just expected it's not anything original i'm glad you brought up i've really i've always liked the fortuna bikes um i i mean one i just like that word uh and what it represents but uh but yeah they've they've had some good liveries over the year and for you to find one that that resonates with artist kev is pretty awesome yeah and if you want to get real technical specifically miro uh, miro's lithographs or where i'm at so uh, lithographs. His lithographs, what, is, his sketches, what is a lithograph a lithograph is a particular type of print where you take a certain type of oil crayon and you draw on a certain specific type of stone you lay it on you pull it off and you can take multiple prints from that it's particularly interesting it was um it was a choice among many hardcore, especially abstract expressionists like uh, Joan Mitchell and I believe um, William de Kooning did a lot of, uh, of lithographs. You can find a lot of abstract expressionists, turn of the century, uh, 30s through 60s artists were painters who would paint on scale large works would also pull their abstract and work their their particular art and sketches off of that so we're getting way off track i could do a whole episode about uh mid-century abstract expressionism if you'd like uh if yeah like, if you want to, if you want to hear kev's art tape leave us some comments about it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Moving on to our number one. So we are switching gears here. We're going from detailed make you think over to straight in your face performance, cars, everything. So here is my number one pick. I wanted to pick a white livery. You know I got to go with Rossi. So we're going with the 2007 Phillip Island Special on the Yamaha M1. This is the Abarth Fiat M1 oh. from Yamaha. I mean, I mean, do I have, do I have to say very much? No, I mean, just gaze upon its glory for a moment. Just know your screen isn't paused. Let it sink in. There it is. It, oh God, just the scorpions in your face. The, the color scheme harkens back to, um, (laughs) to the, you had me fooled Kev. The the color (laughs) scheme harkens back to the, the red, white and black livery that they ran at Valencia in 2005, right? It's kind of something we've already seen from Yamaha, but at the same time, it's, it's amazing. It's new. Uh, they put the checkered flags up front. It's just mean looking and it's, and it's a white motorcycle. That's freaking amazing. It, ah, this this is why it's number it, one right here. It draws upon like that clean uh, classical look. I mean, Rob mentioned the 2005 Valencia bike that year it was their 50th anniversary, and uh, Laguna Seca they run the classic Bumblebee style of the United States mm-hmm. uh, uh, flat trackers. You know, famous back to Kenny Roberts the TZ 750 and all that stuff. And then uh, in at Valencia they ran their international colors raced by Agostini and made famous by a couple of other riders. And while I like that one, that one was near the list. I think the one Rob chose not only is a little more distinct. It calls back to that, but while making it its own, you know, you throw you throw a badass scorpion on the side. I don't care what you're doing. I mean, see the movie Driver. He had a dope members only jacket that you would have been like, whoa, that looks like my creepy uncle's jacket. You slap a scorpion on the back, and suddenly you're curb stomping dudes in elevators. So, because that happens. <laughs> Love that movie. Love that movie. Oh, um, no, yeah. So this really. Really, I gotta, really good soundtrack. No, I gotta, I gotta listen to that one again. All '80s, all the time. <laughs> Re- really resonates with you, Kev. '80s soundtrack. Yes, it does. We already, mm-hmm. we already knew that. Right. No, yeah. So, um, this is our number one pick. Then the Phillip Island Special. I'm sad they didn't run it the entire year. Um, obviously, Fiat needs to get their name out there too. Even though Abarth is their performance side of things, and uh, yeah. Phillip Island was a good round for them. It, uh, no one can beat Casey Stoner there, but that's what happens. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to point out that here's a top five. We could have made five of these top fives. There's so many amazing one-offs out there. It was really hard to choose. We gave ourselves a little bit of rules. They said, you know, you could do a top five that's only Valentino once. I mean, right off the top of my head, I could be like 2005 Valencia, 2003 Valencia. You could be like 2000 Mugello. You could make a whole bunch on just Valentino. You could make a ton on just Casey Stoner or Nikki Hayden. You could make a Nikki Hayden only video. That'd be great too. You know, Nikki Hayden's best, but there's so many to narrow it down to five was difficult but i think we got a pretty good choice a variety of clean of artistic of aggressive uh of classical looking and uh, if you want more of these videos i think you should fucking write in the comment section how much you love them <laughs> all right everyone uh this one went a little long for a top five uh we had problems with dennis joining in but he'll he'll be back next time um like this video share this video subscribe to this channel if you really love seeing Brota GP content, um, we're going to come at you next week with probably a full episode, um, not just a quick top five. We'll be talking about Moto2 and Moto3, and we'll have more people on for that. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and we will catch you later. Peace.